the panel discussion that you are going to listen to is, is a new addition to the uh, talks program this year. Uh, art historians like myself like to put everything into boxes. That is early Renaissance, that is Italian, that is Spanish, that is bronze. It helps us to understand the world of art, this enormous galaxy of objects that are floating around the world. Auction houses do it as well. This is a sale of modern and contemporary art. This is British works on paper. Everything is put into little boxes. And one of the things that Freeze Masters does is it attempts to decompartmentalize everything, to uh, return objects to this sort of wonderful soup in which they were made. Uh, artists didn't make particular works to be British works on paper. They made them to be works of art. And the panel discussion that we're going to listen to today very much extends this uh, approach that Freeze Masters itself is adopting. Collectors, private collectors, share a great deal of the responsibility that museums have for the objects in their care and to the artists that made those objects. But they're much freer of many of the responsibilities that museums have in terms of the way they present the works, any educational obligations. And it leads to much more personal collections, more subjective, more adventurous, more risky, but arguably also more rewarding. And the discussion today, Collecting Beyond Contemporary, brings together two collectors and a museum director. Uh, in the center, delighted to welcome Marguerite Hoffman from Dallas. Marguerite uh, is not just a fabulous collector, a collector of great breadth and athlet athleticism, but also a wonderful philanthropist who has contributed enormously uh, specifically to the Dallas Museum of Art, but also to Harvard, and a whole host of arts and educational uh, projects. Um, sitting on Marguerite's left is Daniel Katz. Danny is here basically <laughs> wearing two hats today. Uh, Danny is not just a, a passionate and very informed collector himself, but also uh, since 1968 a dealer of primarily old master sculpture. Um, today has a gallery just moved to just off Barclay Square and presents extraordinary objects of great beauty and importance from old master times to today. Danny is one of these people that they speak of in hushed tones in art world circles as mm. having a good eye. Uh, and I think this old idea of having an eye and, and whether this is something entirely biological or something that can be learned is going to be part of the discussion. Uh, discussion today. And then moderating the whole conversation, I'm delighted to welcome Wim Piebes from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Wim uh, joined the museum five years into a decade-long renovation and oversaw the last five years of the renovation. Uh, it opened uh, last year in April 2013, a completely revamped institution which we're delighted to have back on the landscape. If any of you haven't been to see the new Rijksmuseum, you must go. So. Thank you all for coming and have a great conversation. Thank you, uh, Jasper. Is the microphone is working, as I hear. Thank you for being with us on this uh, first of a series of talks. Um, Danny, Margaret, um, up to you. I'm the moderator, so I'm a bit in the, in the wings of the, of the stage. I like to start with, with two quotes by two prominent collectors. First is... Uh, Mr. Getty, saying that um, the convey, the, the Romans, the zest, the excitement, suspense, thrills and triumphs that make art collecting one of the most accelerating and satisfying of all human endeavors. That's Getty. And the other quote was in the New York Times last weekend by Leonard Lauder saying, before buying something, the question I always ask myself is this, if it were going to a museum, would it make the cut? So two prominent collectors like you are, one, this Getty speaking from his heart, kind of emotional um, way of collecting, and this Mr. Lauder who has a more kind of, of calculating way of approaching objects and would it make the cut when going to a museum? So I'm very curious on your ideas of collecting, uh, for me as a museum director, it's of course a bit different. We collect for the national collection with public money and you as private collectors, you collect with your own money, which is of unfortunately course, true. Uh, unfortunately <laughs> true. Um, so maybe we have some words about that. But first um, to 
um, give a bit of flavor and to illustrate what kind of collectors you are, we, we asked you to have some objects um, to show to us, to share with us. And Margaret, first is from your collection. Uh, and maybe have some words, anything you'd like to say on these objects coming up to share with us. Sure. Um, I think I'm primarily known, to the extent I'm known at all, in the art world as a contemporary collector. But in the last five or six years, I've fallen in love with medieval illuminated manuscripts and particularly books of hours, which um, kind of takes me back full circle to my graduate study days when I uh, was studying medieval art. So uh, this is um, a work by the master of Jean de Merlon. Um, from the 1520s workshop in Tours. And you're seeing an incredible example of Bathsheba at her bath. Um, and the little figure looking down upon her obviously is King David, who desires her very much and intends to send her husband out to, to be killed so that he can ravish her. Um, I, find, I find that all very interesting. Um, I, in my former life, this is more than you want to know. I was married to an Anglican minister, so I, I'm well churched um, in, in terms of Bible stories, but uh, what I love about this is just the sheer beauty and power, and um, it's, uh, to me, just extremely beautiful, and um, reminds me, obviously, of um, kind of more manneristic uh, tendencies. I have also manuscripts from uh, the early 14th century that are quite different and, and uh, much less robust um, in terms of how the subject matter is handled. But I love this. And then. And how, how long ago did you, did you purchase this for the collection? Is, is, is it in the beginning of your collection or is it somewhere in the middle or is this it recent? This was the first book I bought. This is the first book. That's very um, important. Which is quite interesting. Um, I, w I started buying um, I I in the most silly way. So you're going to talk about the disciplined approach, and, um. and I'm going to talk about the, the undisciplined approach. Um, <laughs> I actually, my husband, Robert, my late husband, and I collected together. And uh, we were very involved in, um, in our private collecting, but also trying to do something that would um, take our museum in our hometown of Dallas and working with other collecting families really upgrade the, the collections for our community. Um, so we had limited resources and we were very focused on what we were trying to do to um, not only enjoy ourselves but also with this eye towards it coming later into the public realm. Um, when Robert died um, I felt a deep need to kind of back away from the contemporary art world, which I succeeded in doing for about 10 minutes. But um, I, I thought, well, I'll go to Maastricht. I've never been to Maastricht, and I'll just learn stuff. I won't be tempted to buy anything. And within 10 minutes, I'm in this wonderful stand looking at medieval manuscripts, and I stayed there for five hours the first day. Wow. And um, it took me four hours to get the gentleman to talk to me. Um, because he had such a bias against Americans. He said, Americans just come in and they want to know, what's the price? And he said, you actually ask some questions first. <laughs> and I thought, Is that true, Danny? About American collectors? I think about that. Uh, okay, okay. That. you come back on that. It's not true. Okay. No, it's okay. not true. Yeah. It's not true. Sometimes we, we, yeah. we don't ask the price right off. Um, I think it's very rude to ask the price to a dealer. I think you should That's just the first question. give them your checkbook and fill in the appropriate amount. <laughs> I think that would be much more better. Manners. Makes your life easy as a dealer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You always want to know, though, can I even begin to fantasize about this? You know, and especially with something quite new, I had no idea of what I call the order of magnitude. I mean, are we, mm. I, I just had no way to understand that. So, but, but we did stay, and the next day I went back for many more hours. But without showing the next picture, the next slides, I mean, for you it might be a small step, but for the audience it might be rather shocking to have this and then the next one, which is Robert Gober. Um, you know, I like to keep them guessing. Um, I, this is really more in my wheelhouse, I think, um, in terms of the, uh, cons the work in the 
collection of what people think about it. Um, Robert Gober, I believe, is one of the most important and most interesting and um, vital um, sculptors of the 20th century. I just was last week at his big opening at MoMA and it was breathtaking. He is so smart and so uh, completely, um, I think, vulnerable in the way he makes his art. Um, you can't help but, this is creepy creepy, right? But with the real human hair and the loopy little girl, you know, lost legs and um, this old Fashion three-legged stool, but then these breasts, which I thought was kind of a, a very um, silly response to the Bathsheba. But um, it, 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 to me, it um, there's something that grabs me right there about he's saying something about family, about domesticity, about loss. Uh, I, I I don't know what all, but uh, is in his mind. But this vocabulary that he's developed. Um, these legs show up all the time, these breasts, sometimes one man's breast, one woman's breast, juxtaposed. Um, these, as I said, these, this alphabet that he, you know, jumbles together mm -hmm. and returns to over decades, I find that quite extraordinary. Is it important um, for you to, to find the right words and to explain why you exactly want to have an object? Or is it just, I just want to have it because I just want to have it, I feel I need this to have. Well, collectors have, are crazy. You know they're crazy. Is I mean, so? true collector, collectors, they're... Crazy they're, in, what, in what sense? Well, they do have, uh, they always talk about, I need, you know, we don't ha have any needs, but but we have true desires, and sometimes they're, I mean, mm. I don't know. That's do true. You, do you feel about this? Sometimes I can't sleep at night, you just think about something, and then you, yeah, you know, it's, it's like you get possessed a bit. Um, I think the um, desire to own something, particularly works of art, is uh, almost overpowering. It can take over your life. It becomes, a d as you say, a desire. It's like when you're a young man and you desire a beautiful young girl, uh, you go crazy in your mind right. with desire to obtain that, that person. Once you've got it, you, it's on to the next. I'm not, <laughs> saying, I'm not saying, and this is not me personally, of course, I wouldn't be like that. I'm a, I'm a, You're completely I'm a, loyal I believe and in chiv chivalry, whatever that is. And um, I think the desire to own is, is incredible. I mean, it can go through the whole spectrum of the human condition, from children collecting postage stamps to someone in a little child in Africa buying, collecting Coca-Cola bottle tops to... There's been uh, many books written, uh, philosophical studies and debates about why people need to collect. It goes back to innate childhood ideas. I suppose Freud would have ideas about it also. But right. um, the, in it, as you get older and perhaps you can increase your buying potential, you can afford better things, your intellect gets more, you experience more, you have more information at hand and you go out there and... I think what you do is between contemporary art and the medieval manuscript, is there parallels to be drawn? It doesn't matter. All art reflects the previous culture. It's all reflecting and relating to something else that's been done. I think what you're doing is amazing. I can't, I suppose you could see, you mentioned about the breasts of Bathsheba you, and the breasts here. That's for you to see it's an it, easy you know. conversational yeah. way to just go just makes into conversation, it, but. but they're both. I do find this actually quite a interesting work of art. Well, do I find it beautiful? No, not beautiful at all. Oh, is it supposed to be ugly. beautiful? But um, I find it challenging and interesting, and you can talk about it, and it creates debate and discussion. Therefore, it has its relevant time now in your house.